Hey everyone. Okay, so uh, today we're going to start with an introduction to chapter six, which is bones. And um, again, my video camera did not was not able to record the actual lecture that I gave, so I'm going to do my best to mimic that here in my home office. So, um, with that said, let's go ahead and let me switch to screen share mode so that we can do this. Here we go. Okay, so. You should still be able to see me in the upper corner, and I'm going to flip through this, and we'll get through the first um, half or so of the PowerPoint and cover the basics of the skeletal system. So um, in this chapter here, we're talking about the bones. We're talking about um, the joints, which would be a part of this, but the joints are covered in the next chapter. The joints are covered in the, um, the, the chapter I want to say it's chapter eight um, off the top of my head. So anyways, bones are the main organ. That's the key here, right? So like any organ, we're talking about more than one type of tissue. So the type of tissue that makes up bone is called osseous tissue. There's also dense irregular connective tissue, which makes up the periosteum that surrounds the bone. And then of course the inner uh, bone marrow, which is contained inside of our long bones. And, and that is also um, irregular connective tissue. So let's talk about some functions before we get too far into the structure of bones. So first of all, the, fir the first function that you probably thought of already is protection, right? Uh, our skeletal system is there to protect our body. If you think about all of the uh, really uh, vulnerable organs, our brain, our heart, our lungs, uh, they're all surrounded by something bony, right? Even our reproductive organs are surrounded by our bony pelvis. And so bone is there to protect and uh, protect the underlying soft tissues. The next one is mineral storage. So most people don't think about this, but our bones are actually like a sink for minerals. In other words, it's kind of like um, a storage unit. So say you uh, are ingesting too much calcium, guess where you store it? In your bones. Say you need calcium, you're not bringing in enough calcium. Guess what your bones do? Release calcium. Your bones will physically dissolve to release the calcium into the surrounding fluid. So in this way, bones act as a, a storage facility for minerals, phosphate and calcium being the main minerals. Uh, magnesium is another one. Our bones also, because uh, these ingredients, calcium and phosphate, uh, magnesium, because they're ions, uh, the, the bones can actually also help with acid-base balance and acid-base homeostasis in the body. And so um, we'll talk about homeostasis and fluid balance when you're in AMP2, but it's another function of the skeletal system that you need to understand for this section. Of course, our, our bones also are responsible for making blood cells. That's where they're all born. Our, all of our blood cells originate from our bone marrow. Uh, it's a process called hematopoiesis. We'll talk about this process more in AMP2. You'll get to see all the ins and outs and stages of hematopoiesis. But for right now, you need to understand that the red bone marrow is where blood cells are made. It's a special type of connective tissue that allows that to happen. Next, uh, fat storage. Almost nobody realizes that our bones, specifically our long bones, when I say long bones, we'll get into this, you should think of like our limbs, like our arms and leg bones. Those bones actually store fat, <laughs> right? And so it's a, it's a separate uh, place where our body kind of stores fat away for emergency purposes. And so it's called yellow bone marrow and it's inside of our long bones as well. So it stores extra energy for when we need it in emergency situations. Obviously our bones are there for movement. So our bones are what our skeletal muscles attach to and they act as levers to allow our body to move and flex and extend in certain ways so that we can actually get from place to place so that we can you know, form words you know, as our jaw flaps up and down, things like that. So movement is a key uh, function of our skeletal system. And of course, support, right? Our skeletal system supports our entire body. It supports the weight of the body and it provides a framework for all of our nerves, all of our blood vessels, all of our muscles, right, all of the lymphatics, all of the skin, right, everything builds off of the bone. The, and we even use this as, you know, general vocabulary terms. Sometimes we'll talk about the skeleton or the bones of a house. I know last year when we were house shopping, 
we would say that all the time. We'd be like, eh, we don't really like the carpet or this or that, but the bones of the house are really good, right? And so what we meant by that is the framework and the actual support of the house, how the house is made and how the house is put together. It's the same concept with the skeletal system in our body. It's, a, it's our foundation of what everything builds off of. So this, this picture here comes directly from your textbook and summarizes all of the functions. One of the things you might do with this is print it one slide per page, and then you can actually fold this page. Do you know what I mean when I say one slide per page? Um, I'll quick show you since I'm doing screen share. When you go to print, um, you have the option to print the PowerPoints. This says full page slide, so it literally would be this on every single page. You know, each individual slide is on each individual page, or this is how I would suggest doing it for you know, to save the world so that you only have six slides per page. Um, or you can also do it um, three slides per page with notes. So I, I don't know if I ever addressed that in another lecture or in class, but in case I haven't, now I am. <laughs> so I'm obviously not going to print this right now, but I wanted to sh share that with you. You can also select individual slides to print, such as this. Print it one slide per page, and then you can physically bend this section out, the section that has all of the answers, and see if you can fill it out on the other side without looking at this. So it's kind of like an interactive note card. All right, so let's get into the structure of our bones. So our bones first of all, are classified into different uh, structures, and, and it's basically based on their shape. So one is long bones, and this is probably the bony bone that you thought of when I said that we're going to talk about bones, right? These are the, the bones of our arms and legs, and you're probably familiar with some of them, the femur, the humerus, the radius, the ulna, right? These are the bones of our appendages, and so they're named after their shape, not their actual size. So some of them can be very, very small. In fact, long bones would be like the long, the are some of our finger bones, our phalange bones are, are considered long bones as well. So not always um, very, very long, but it's because they have this elongated uh, center part and then um, special parts on the end of them that allow for other bones to connect with them. Okay, we also have short bones. Again, not named for their shape, but, but rather um, their, their size. So they're kind of cube-ish shaped. They're not, they're not long and stretched up like the long bones. They're more squatty, if that's a word, right? So these are the bones of our wrist, which we call the carpals, and the bones of our ankles, which we call the tarsals. You can remember this, we drive a car with our carpals, you step on tar with your tarsals. So this is an example of a bone in our wrist called the trapezium. The trapezium is one of our small wrist bones. Don't worry, you'll get to know all of the wrist bones, all of the ankle bones, it's coming. <laughs> um, so we also have flat bones. So we have long bones, short bones. So what do you need to know? Know the types of bones and some examples of each of them would be good as well because this knowledge is going to build and you're eventually going to need to know that. So flat bones, these are bones that are kind of broad and flat as the name suggests. So this would be bones of our skull, our sternum, uh, our ribs, even our pelvic bones. So the way these bones look when you actually, if you were to take a skull bone and kind of do a section of it so you could see inside of it, it almost looks like a sandwich or a piece of cardboard in that you have these two flat pieces and then some mesh work in between, right? Picture that piece of cardboard. That's what all of these bones look like when you do a cross section of them. And so that's gonna provide extra area for bone cell formation and fat storage. That's what those, that little uh, center area is for. And then we have irregular bones. So irregular bones are like, eh, it doesn't fit into that category or that category has all these projections off of it. So these would be some of our skull bones, uh, as well as like the vertebrae, right? Look how weird the vertebrae is shaped. And when we're in lab, you'll be able to see the, the skeletal model. Those vertebrae have this nice rounded disc area that makes sense. And then all of these projections coming off of it. But, and all of the projections off of bones, they're there for muscle attachment. That's why the vertebrae have all of these muscles. You don't realize all of the muscles that you have to contract in order to sit upright, in order to stand, in order to bend over and pull yourself back up. There's a lot of muscles back there. You may, might be aware of it if you've ever had a back injury, then you become very aware of all of those muscles. Um, but that's why all our, our bones have these projections. It's for muscle attachment. And again, you'll get to know all of those points of attachment. 
in lab. Finally, we have sesamoid bones. So sesamoid bones are bones that have formed within tendons. So an example of this would be the patella. The patella or our kneecap is a special bone. Sometimes it's called a membranous bone. It's a bone that has formed within a membrane or within a tendon. And so they tend to be oval seed like. Um, shaped, which is why it's called sesamoid, like a sesame seed. So this, whoops, this table here summarizes all of those and gives you an example. So remember I said you might want to know an example of each. Might be a good essay question on a test or, um, well, I don't give you essays on quizzes, but um, on a test or, or on a practical, like an open-ended question, you know, which of these is not, or um, name all the types of bones and an example of each, correct? Okay. So let's get back to bone structure. So we're talking about a long bone here, and um, this is where the specifics come into play. So all of the other types of bones, short bones, irregular bones, sesamoid bones, right? they all have most of these properties, but from here on, what we're gonna be focused on is the structure of a long bone. We wanna understand how the bones of our arms and legs are put together, because this is uh, going to be crucial in having us understand all the homeostasis and all of the muscle stuff that comes about. So this is kind of where all the action takes place when it comes to bone structure. So we'll start on the very outside with a structure called the periosteum. The periosteum is a bone blanket, okay? It's actually a double membrane. The, the periosteum has on it, literally picture, I have a blanket here, I'll show you. Um, so it literally is as if the bone is wrapped in a complete blanket and it's actually a double blanket in that it has an inside and an outside. It has two layers to it. And much like this blanket that I have here, the inside of it is very different from the outside of it. It's the same thing with your periosteum. The inner workings of your periosteum is different than the outside of your periosteum. You can think of the periosteum as being attached to the bone, kind of like Velcro, because it has these perforating fibers, also called Sharpies fibers, that literally Velcro it into the bone so that those fibers actually go into those superficial bone cells and help anchor it and hold it in place. The periosteum is made of dense irregular connective tissue. So again, think of that kind of spiderweb network of collagen surrounding the bone. It's going to hold the bone together in case the bone breaks. If you've ever had a fracture, we'll talk about fractures eventually, that periosteum holds the bones together. This is what allows your bone to grow back together without needing surgery. Um, and it's also going to provide a route of entry for all of the nerves and blood vessels that are going to feed those growing bone cells on the inside. So you can see just uh, on this diagram here, uh, diagram A, the external structure, you can see that kind of velcroiness, how it peels off and it looks kind of velcroy there. Those perforating fibers are the little strands of velcro that hold it in place. We'll talk more about the composition of the periosteum as we go. So the diaphysis is the long section, it's also called the shaft of the long bone. And each end of a long bone has something called an epiphysis. So you have epiphyses and you have a diaphysis. I'm gonna pause the video now so that I can kind of uh, flip through these next couple of slides while I'm drawing. It'll make it a little bit more engaging for you. You can draw along with me. So um, give me just a second. I'm gonna stop sharing and pause. The okay, so I'm coming at you now. I The way this looks for me as your instructor right now, I have the PowerPoint on, um, and then I can also see myself so I can see what I'm what you see, um, but you might, like I said, also want to have the PowerPoint next to you because I'm going to follow along. I'm just going to lecture up here just like I would in a normal lecture hall. So we just went through a couple of um, terms and I'm talking again, this is about a long bone. And so a typical long bone, again, you don't have to be an artist in order to draw a bone. Um, we have an epiphysis on both ends of our long bone. And so here's where directional terminology comes into play. Um, you have two epiphyses on your long bones. So think about this. What word, what directional term would we use to describe this epiphysis? You would call this the proximal epiphysis, right? You would call this end the distal epiphysis. So to be more specific, let's add the name of the bone in there. This bone is our humerus. You would say that this attachment up here is the proximal epiphysis of the humerus 
This is the distal epiphysis of the humerus. Do you see how those terms come into play? So here's our epiphyses. This whole shaft is the diaphysis. Right? So that's how we structure our long bones here. The diaphysis is covered with that periosteum, right? Uh, that bone blanket that we mentioned, the bone blanket that has two layers. So the periosteum has an inner cellular layer and an outer fibrous layer. This isn't from the PowerPoint, this is just me adding it up here because that's how I, how I roll sometimes. The ends of our long bone are covered with articular cartilage. So if you have different colored pencils or markers with you, go ahead and draw that in, make it look a little different. The ends of our long bones are covered with articular cartilage. And so do you remember what type of cartilage this is that covers the ends of bones? It's hyaline cartilage. So the ends of our bones, our epiphyses, are covered <laughs> oh, sorry, with hyaline cartilage. Inside of our diaphysis, this is a hollowed out cavity. Again, switch colors, go to a different color. This is going to help you visually understand it. And it also will create a key as we start labeling different things. It gets kind of messy. So in here, we have our medullary cavity. Right, the medullary cavity is hollow. Inside the medullary cavity is red and yellow bone marrow. Depending on which bone in the body, it might be red, it might be yellow, it might be a mix. So medullary cavity with marrow is what I'll write up here, but just understand that there's a couple differences that it might be. So it's a hollow cavity and um, we'll get into the structure of it in just a second. So this is our, the, the overall long bone. The long bone is made up of two types of bone. Not all bones are created equal. So in other words, I'll just rearrange this stuff down here real quick. The bone that's down here is different than the bone that's here. It's different than the bone that's on the outside. It's different than the bone that's inside this epiphysis. We have two types of bone. You have what we call compact bone and what we call spongy bone. So compact bone is bone that, where the bone cells are very tightly packed together and is highly organized. Spongy bone, sometimes called cancellous bone, is more like struts. It's kind of like stalactites and stalagmites in a cave. They kind of grow in different directions and all different ways, like a spider web almost. I love to use that spider web analogy if you haven't um, caught on to that. So the epiphyses have what we call spongy bone or cancellous bone inside of them. So our epiphyses have, and I'm going to draw that kind of like this with just lots of X's. Because what spongy bone does is spongy bone resists force in multiple directions. So it's kind of like pushing on uh, like a ball, right? When you push on a ball, it's just going to squish. It doesn't matter from which side you squish it on, right? But if you have a stick and you're squishing the stick or you're applying force to the stick, it's more likely to break in that direction because it doesn't have that same flexibility as these ends, right? Um, so, compact bone is what makes up our diaphysis. Compact bone is what makes up the majority of our long bone, the long part of our long bone. And this, this compact bone only resists force in one direction. The compact bone is literally stacked on top of each other like this. It's meant to resist that gravitational force, that pushing down force that is always on us. I'm speaking mostly of our legs. Obviously, our arms don't have the same force of gravity, which is why our arm bones are shorter. There's actually a law in physics, it's called Wolf's Law. Wolf's Law says that if you apply force to bone, it will grow in response to that force. Um, and you know this if you've ever had an injury before and your injury healed, right? If you've had a, a bone break, um, they will tell you to, to hold off doing weight-bearing exercise, and then they'll tell you to do weight-bearing exercise or physical therapy, and weight-bearing exercise will be a part of that physical therapy. There's a reason, because the more weight you apply to the bone, the more your bone is going to grow in response to it. Think about people who are wheelchair bound, or if you yourself have ever been um, immobilized for a certain period of time, not only do your muscles get smaller, your bones get smaller also. Wolf's Law proves that. Wolf, Wolf's Law provides evidence for why that happens. It's because our bones 
our body grows in, in response to the stresses we put on it. And so if we're putting weight bearing, um, if we're doing weight bearing exercise, our bones are going to sh sh grow stronger because of it. This is one of the reasons why they always say, especially for women as they age and their estrogens levels drop, for them to do weight exercises because using the weights and actually walking and physically putting that stress on your bones is going to help them grow thicker and heavier so that you reduce your risks of osteoporosis. Of course, that's important for everybody, but mostly for older women because of the hormones. So let's talk about some other things we have going on in here. So there's a boundary line, and you can see this on the long bones. It's a boundary, I'm just grab it in a different color, a boundary between the epiphysis and the diaphysis, it's called the metaphysis. The metaphysis. This is also called the growth plate while it's actively growing. So in somebody uh, before the end of puberty, so basically, well, let's just say 18. Let's say everyone stops puberty at 18 and you're done growing. It varies based on hormone, age, nutrition, etc. But let's say at that age, anyone below that age, that age that they stop puberty, this is actually made of cartilage. And this is how your long bones grow. We'll talk about that in a minute. But that growth happens at that metaphysis and these cells keep adding on to each other. And that's how your bones get longer and longer and longer. And so after puberty, the growth plate itself seals. It seals up and now becomes solid bone, and then you stop growing. And it actually is a type of joint. When we go into the next chapter, you'll see that. And so we call it an epiphyseal line after it has sealed. So a growth plate or epiphyseal line, depending on which stage of the game you're at. If you're actively growing, it's a plate. If you're done growing, it's a line. And you can actually see it on the x-rays. If you've ever had an x-ray before of your long bones um, at the joint cavity, you'll be able to see a line um, depending on you know what age you were. If you take a x-ray of a, of a baby right after they're born or very close to birth or even before birth, you'll see that it's actually separate bones. You'll actually see a long bone and then like a ball here and a ball there and they're not even connected at all, uh, which is why babies are super flexible. Um, that would be an in utero, so that would be a fetus. Uh, babies when they're born, their, their bones are mostly fused together except their small bones. Um, okay, let me make sure I'm hitting everything. All right, that's just a picture. I'm flipping through the PowerPoint. Okay, so let's get back to the um, the periosteum structure because um, right now I'm on slide 21. If you're following along, it just talks about the different structures between short, flat, and irregular bones. How they don't really have the diaphysis, um, but they're still covered by the periosteum. All of our bones. The periosteum is again providing that entrance point for vessels nerves and it helps hold the bone together in case it is um, broken. Most of those bones all have what we call the spongy bone inside of it. So we'll, we'll take a closer look at the difference between compact and spongy bone um, as we go. Let's first address how our bones get their blood supply. Again, imagine a blanket wrapped around this structure and the blanket itself has blood vessels and nerve endings um, inside of it and wrapped into it. It's kind of like interwoven between the collagen fibers. And you know this, if you've ever broken a bone, it's extremely painful. Not because your bone has the nerves on it, but that periosteum does. And that's, that's how you feel that pain, is because the periosteum is under stress. So our long bones will actually have little holes on the ends, and sometimes it's even in the middle, depending on which bone it is, but they'll have uh, a special hole or a cavity. You'll be able to see this on some of our bone models that provides an access point for blood vessels coming in. So blood vessels literally will enter, right, there's an artery, right? They'll literally enter in, and sometimes they come in through the middle, depending on which bone it is, right? And they leave through access points. And so they're called nutrient arteries and nutrient veins, and then they fuse back together with the periosteum. So these are, nutrient artery slash vein. And so that's how the inside of our bone gets the nutrients that it needs. Um, those, those vessels are coming from the periosteum. And so they come in through little holes called the nutrient foramen. Sometimes called their nutrient foramina. That, that suffix I-N-A means that it's small. 
and foramen is the fancy word for hole. So it's literally a nutrient hole is what it, what it translates to. And so there would be a nutrient foramen there, a nutrient foramen there, and a nutrient foramen there. And again, you'll be able to see this on some of our bones. It's actually a little hole or an access point into the bone that our blood vessels go through. And so this nutrient artery or vein comes from the periosteum. So it's just a little branch off of the um, periosteum that goes into the bone itself. And of course, it's going to supply the red bone marrow uh, that's in there. So red bone marrow um, is only the certain, certain types of bones in our body. So the femur has red bone marrow, the pelvis, pelvic bones, the sternum, the vertebrae, the ribs. Children need lots of bone marrow because they're growing. And so they have a lot, almost all their bones have red bone marrow. But once you're older uh, and you're done growing, uh, there's only a few bones in your body that actually will produce those blood cells anymore. The rest is just fat storage. Um, and that's what yellow bone marrow is, right? It's the fat storage. So uh, there's, of course, bone marrow transplantation, which if you have not joined the transplantation uh, list, I guess, I don't know, it's like a catalog, you um, can join to, to donate that and um, it's it will help save lives because um, uh, people that have blood cancer specifically need uh, bone marrow transplant. Sorry, I like lost my train of thought there. Of course, it can be, just like with any transplant, it can be very um, dangerous because here you're talking about um, uh, all your tissues and all of your blood cells have to get along with that bone marrow. And so there's lots of factors that play a role in that. So the transplant gets really tricky with bone marrow. So let's talk about the microscopic structure of bone. So this is the macroscopic structure. This is what we see when we look at an actual bone in our hands. But there's a whole lot that's going on behind the scenes. And so this is what makes the difference between compact bone and spongy bone. And this is the, uh, the, the building blocks of this entire bony structure. And, and so it breaks down to, again, realizing that bone is a type of connective tissue, right? And connective tissue is made of living stuff and non-living stuff, right? So the, the living cells, right, the osteocytes that we'll talk about in a minute, and then the, the matrix, right, that, that extracellular stuff, the fibers and the ground substance. So the, the inorganic matrix, in other words, the non-living stuff, dominates in bone. There's more non-living stuff than living stuff. So the majority of the non-living stuff in our bones, of course, is calcium. And the calcium in our bones is in the form of calcium phosphate, CaPO4. Um, and so that calcium phosphate is the uh, main ingredient in the hardness factor of our bones. And then the other non-living factor is, of course, collagen, right? Collagen is, the, is what provides our bones flexibility. You can actually do an experiment where you take a chicken bone, next time you have wings or ribs or something, take one of the bones, and dissolve it in vinegar. Wait a couple of days. The vinegar, the acetic acid, will actually dissolve away the calcium phosphate. And so what you have left is just the collagen, right? And you'll see how flexible a bone actually is. We tend to think of our bones as these rigid structures, right? Just like we think of trees as rigid structures. But have you ever watched a tree sway in the breeze? It moves. It's kind of scary if they're close to your house. They move, they bend and sway, and so do your bones. If you were to take like a micrograph image of your femur, for example, your big thigh bone, and look at it when you're not putting pressure on it, as opposed to when you're actually standing on it, you would see that there's actually giving and, and taking in it. It's actually compressing and bending a little bit with the weight of your body on top of it. And that's pretty cool if you think about it. So the inorganic matrix and the organic matrix are the two main components. Again, that inorganic matrix is mostly calcium phosphate. It's also held together with like a, a crystal. There's like a crystal structure that holds it together. You don't need to be too concerned with that. Just understand that it is calcium phosphate that is that hard material that makes our bones so um, uh, well brittle, really. It makes them very, very hard and not forgiving, right? That mixed with the collagen, uh, which is our organic matrix, provides this perfect balance between flexibility and rigidity, right? And so it, there's this constant hem and haul between those two parts that makes our bones so great for what they do for our bodies. So um, flipping on, oh, I guess it's slide 32 that shows you 
how that matrix can be dissolved. It's pretty cool, right? Um, and then of course, it also shows you what happens when there's no collagen and there's just the brittle crystals or how it can shatter very, very easily. So let's talk about the types of bone cells. And I'm, keep, I'm keeping it on this mode because I do wanna draw some of the things here for bone cells. So right now, if you're following along on the PowerPoint, I'm on slide 33. So there's three types of bone cells that make up all parts of bone, whether it's compact or uh, spongy bone. And these are osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. So we've talked about osteocytes before. In fact, in chapter four, we identify that osteocytes are bone cells, which is true. These are the living bone cells. If we looked at any part of this, we would see bone cells. What we haven't mentioned are the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. So osteoblasts are bone builders, the B in osteoblasts, bone builders. That's what they do, they build bone. And by building bone, you should think of the collagen secretion and that calcium phosphate harvesting. So they basically create this barrier, this perfect mixture of calcium phosphate and collagen. They lay it down. They're like the bricklayers of the cell, of the bone, I should say. They're laying down all of this nonstop, right? Osteoclasts do the opposite. Osteoclasts take the bone matrix and dissolve it. They break it down. And you're probably wondering, why would we want that? We'll get there. <laughs> There's a reason for it. So osteoblasts, I'm moving on to the next slide now. Osteoblasts um, are the, the metabolically active cells. These are the ones that are doing the job. They're basically immature bone cells. So if we think about how bone cells are created, osteo osteocytes, how are osteocytes created? They actually all begin their life as an osteoblast. So an osteoblast is a baby osteocyte, for lack of a better term. Just kind of imagine it in your head, right? And so you have this little osteoblast, and what it's doing is it's secreting calcium phosphate and collagen all around it until it forms a little nest. It basically hoards calcium and phosphate all around it and collagen until it has nowhere to go. It's stuck. It has a little nest that it lives in. It lives in a nest called a lacuna. Lacuna, I'll write the word up here. You'll see it in the PowerPoint. A lacuna or lacunae. This is the whole where the, the cell lives. I think of it as a nest, a nest for a bone cell. And so once that osteoblast gets completely surrounded by calcium phosphate and collagen, it's now called an osteocyte. It's now mature. So osteocytes are stuck in their lacuna. They're literally buried under the mess that the osteoblast created. So osteoblasts come from osteoprogenitor cells. So most of our tissues have some sort of stem cell associated with them. We, we talked about the cells of the stratum basal, right, when we were talking about the integumentary system is actively dividing uh, epidermal stem cells. Well, our bone cells have stem cells also, osteoprogenitor cells. These osteoprogenitor cells differentiate and form osteoblasts. Osteoblasts secrete the calcium phosphate and collagen and bury themselves in a lacuna and become an osteocyte. Pause the video and rewrite that out. See if you can make a flow chart of that, what I just said, all right? That is all the process of deposition, right? Pulling stuff from the blood, pulling nutrients from the blood, right? And building this matrix around the bone cell. So that's one thing. The osteocytes living in the lacuna, right, are the active live bone cells that are sitting there doing their job. They're maintaining the matrix around them, they're organizing things, right? They're communicating with each other. They're metabolizing and producing waste products that will be removed through the nutrient for Raymond. That's what they do. Osteo, oops. Okay, so the, uh, did I skip it? Oh, I didn't, okay, we haven't done osteoclast yet. So I'm on slide 37. Slide 37 shows this process of deposition, right? It shows these osteogenic cells or osteoprogenitor cells secreting so much that they eventually become osteoblasts and eventually become osteocytes. But that's the whole purpose, you're forming bone. Osteoclasts are actually made of a completely different type of cell. So they don't come from the osteoprogenitor cells that osteoblasts come from. They have a different um, mesenchymal-like structure. So osteoclasts 
actually do the opposite of osteoblasts. So they dissolve, right? They're gonna dissolve away all that hard work the osteoblast just did building, they're gonna come around and dissolve it. And so again, you might say, well, why would we want that? It's really about homeostasis and balance in your body, right? So the way they do this, it's called bone resorption. So instead of bone re deposition, we have bone resorption. Bone resorption is where the hydrogen ions, which is basically acid, right, and enzymes get secreted. Have you ever watched something dissolve? I'm sure at some point in chemistry, you've watched a little tablet dissolve, right? And, or think of Alka-Seltzer or anything that you would mix with water and you see it fizz and dissolve. That's the way these osteoclasts work. They're literally dissolving the bone matrix around them. And then they're releasing the calcium and the phosphate back into the blood. So these have a totally different structure than osteoblasts and they're there to dis dissolve and do the reverse of what osteoblasts do. So um, they secrete this substance and, and then the calcium phosphate goes into the blood, right? It, it's dissolved and goes right back in here. And so the position and the location of these things is important. So osteoblasts are usually are right underneath of the periosteum. So they're on the very most superficial side of our bone, and they're also sprinkled within the medullary cavity. So you have osteoblasts on the very, very inside of the cell, osteoblasts on the very, very outside of the cell, osteocytes making up this kind of width in between the very superficial side and the lining of the medullary cavity. That's where you would find the osteocytes, right? Down here, kind of the same thing. These are mostly mature osteocytes down here. There might be a few osteoclasts, the dissolving ones, but not a lot of osteoblasts anymore. The ends are done growing. Osteoclasts are sprinkled throughout the outside of the bone, but the majority of the osteoclasts live in this medullary cavity. The lining of the medullary cavity is it's actually an incomplete lining. So we think of the periosteum as this whole blanket, you know, it surrounds the whole, it surrounds the whole bone. I'm so cold today surrounds the whole bone, right? But the osteo, uh, the, the inside lining of our medullary cavity is different. The inside lining of our medullary cavity is incomplete. So it's kind of like a blanket that doesn't cover you all the way. You know, it's just like a patch here and a patch here and a patch there. That lining of the medullary cavity is called the endosteum. And that's what these green lines are. So the endosteum has osteoclasts in it has osteoclasts in it. That inner lining has these dissolving cells on the inside for bone reassorption. So here you see just the chemical reaction itself. I'm looking at slide 40 now. Um, you see that chemical reaction that takes place. Don't be so concerned with the chemicals involved. Make sure you understand what osteoclasts do. That's the important part. So, when we look at and start to understand how this compact bone is put together, we see that there's a functional unit that's called an osteon. So osteons are different in spongy bone and compact bone. And so that's what we're gonna kind of look at up here. It's a structure that is what we call the functional unit of bone. And it's called an osteon. And it's different between compact bone and spongy bone. So we'll look at the osteon structure of compact bone first, I think, yep. Uh, this is slide 38. So here's, here's the gist of it. We're gonna draw it and then we'll fill in the vocabulary. Again, grab some colored pencils, draw along with me. Drawing uses the other side of your brain, so it's really good to do it, especially if you're struggling with all of this vocabulary. We're gonna draw what looks like a tree trunk, right, like rings, like a solar system. In the middle of this tree trunk, if you have a blue and a red, grab it, because that's our nutrient artery and nutrient vein. They're branches from the nutrient artery and nutrient vein. This is what we call the central canal. That's called the central canal. These rings that surround the central canal are called concentric lamella. The concentric lamella, this is, I'm looking at slide 42, and it just calls them lamella, but it's called concentric lamella because there's actually a couple different types of lamella that we'll mention. Some, some people say lamellae, 
I say lamella, tomato, tomato. Pick whichever way you like. <laughs> so the lamella are where the osteons live. So kind of almost like an atom, like in chemistry, right? You have these little nests, right? In chemistry, these would have been like electrons or something, right? But here we have little areas. And I'm just gonna draw like a black dot in there just to keep it simple. These are the bone cells. These are mature bone cells. So think in your head, what's a mature bone cell called? Right, these are osteocytes. They're living in the lacuna. Osteocytes in lacuna, right? The lacuna is the nest that they live in. Don't confuse lacuna with lamella, right? Lamella is the ring, lacuna is the nest. And the osteocytes are the mature bone cells that have been completely surrounded by calcium phosphate and um, collagen. And so you can imagine, this is a very hard structure, right? This is like embedded in rock almost, right? Think of it, if that's what helps you picture it, right? There's lots of collagen fibers perforating throughout. And the whole purpose here, right? This is an osteon. This would be like if we're looking, if we did a transverse section of our long bone here, and we're looking down on top of it, you would see lots of osteon. You would see this, right? So they're kind of long and tubular. They're going the length of the diaphysis right? Because they're going to provide that unidirectional support. So the collagen fibers are coming out at you when we draw it in this 2D world. The collagen fibers would be running like this, right? So that it would resist stress and pressure coming from that top bottom uh, direction. So we label the central canal, right? The central canal has the nutrient artery and nutrient vein that come off of the uh, periosteum, the lacuna, right? And there's also little canals that connect all of these things together so they can exchange nutrients and waste products, right? And get all of their waste products and nutrients back to that central canal. They're called canaliculi. It's a fun word to say. It literally translates to little canal. Canaliculi. So the canaliculi allow the osteocytes to communicate with themselves and allow them to exchange materials with the nutrient artery and nutrient vein. There's also what we call interstitial lamella. So imagine, again, this is just one osteon of this whole cross section, but there would be another one here, right? And there would be another one here, right? But in between, in between the osteons, this is osteon number two, where I'm just labeling it. There's stuff here. This is called interstitial lamella. I'm gonna erase the word canaliculi there just so I can, right? There's still bone cells here. They're still there. They're just not arranged in an osteon. These are interstitial lamella. They're the lamella in between the osteons. So osteons are not permanent structures. They will be dissolved and regrow, right, depending on osteoblast and osteoclast activities. If, if this osteon is lining that medullary cavity, there might be a big old osteoclast that lives right here that says, you know what, I need to dissolve some bone matrix, and it might start eating away at this osteon. That's how the osteoclasts work. Couple other terms to keep in mind. One is, and I just advanced it to slide 47. One is circumferential lamella. So circumferential lamella go around the entire outer surface of the long bone. So remember we said uh, the, the compact bone makes up the outermost and innermost parts, right, of this, of this structure. So the circumferential lamella are the ones that go around the entire long bone. These are the ones that are embedded with the, um, the vessels of the periosteum. These are the ones that connect to the periosteum, and they all have big uh, perforating canals going into uh, the medullary cavity to get the blood cells and stuff in and out from there, They're called perforating canals. So lots of things going on here. Slide 48 puts it all together. If you're not an artist or you wanna perfect your drawing, you can check that out. Spongy bone is put together differently. So when we talk spongy bone, you should be thinking about the ends 
and the medullary cavity itself, which is where spongy bone is located. So this is not really a weight-bearing piece. Spongy bone is for force in multiple directions. So we're looking at impact from this way and this way, squishing a ball, right? And so it's made of lots of struts, stalactites and stalagmites, as I like to think of, or this kind of spider web, cobweb structure. So there's still osteons in there, but they're not the same structure as this. They're kind of random osteocytes surrounded by bone matrix. It's not the same organization. The struts that make up spongy bone, I just went to slide 50, are called trabeculae. So they're kind of like these little bony, I don't know, they look like, I don't, I don't even know what they look like, but they're, they have the osteocytes inside of there and they can dissolve and rebuild just like um, the compact bone can. So uh, let's talk about a couple of different uh, diseases and disorders related to all of this because you're probably thinking about some. Osteopetrosis, not the same thing as osteoporosis. This is uh, where your osteoclasts don't properly degrade and so your bone mass increases. Um, and with all of that increase in bone mass, you don't have the collagen to support it so your bones are very, very brittle. Um, this can also uh, lead to other complications um, throughout development. So that leads us to ossification and how bones actually form. So sometimes we call it osteo ossification and sometimes we call it osteogenesis. Either way, uh, this is the period when bones form. And so this starts obviously in utero. So before you're even born, the bones are fusing and it begins uh, very early on in development. Um, and so there's two different ways that bones form. One is called endochondral ossification, which is what we'll talk about next. Um, and one is called intramembranous ossification. So it ultimately starts from immature cartilage or immature bone that eventually forms the compact organized structure of the bones that we just drew. So let's talk about uh, the difference between intramembranous ossification. Intramembranous ossification is when there's uh, like a connective tissue model that's being built, whereas endochondral ossification is using hyaline cartilage as a model. So both of them are, bone just doesn't like appear out of nowhere, right? It's going to grow along an axis that has already been created either by connective tissue or by cartilage. I know cartilage is a type of connective tissue, just specifically cartilage. So, oops, let's talk about intramembranous quickly. So intramembranous starts where, uh, first of all, this is bones like uh, our skull bones, our mandible, um, other, other small bones in our body are formed this way. So the primary bone is what we call, uh, is formed from the, the mesenchymal cells. So the mesenchymal stem cells that we mentioned in connective tissue come together and decide that they're gonna turn into osteoblasts, right? So they differentiate into osteoblasts and they start forming this bone tissue. So they form what's called a primary ossification center, or it's kind of like the headquarters of where bone is forming. And this will happen all over the place until eventually the flat bone is formed and all of the primary ossification centers fuse together. That's how intramembranous works, right? It's just from a, a mesenchymal connective tissue uh, derivative. Right, so you have osteogenic cells, right, which form osteoblasts, and then the osteoblasts eventually surround themselves and become osteocytes. The process of collecting the, the calcium and, and laying down the calcium matrix is called calcification. So there's two different processes, right? You have ossification, right, and then you have calcification. Ossification is creating the bone tissue itself, right? And when we think of bone tissue, you should be thinking of calcium calcium phosphate, collagen, and osteocytes, those three things. Calcification is just the, the pulling of calcium from your blood and depositing it onto the bone. So that's all it is. So there's, there's two processes, right, that have to take place in order for your bones to mature well. You need the bone cells to grow, you need the collagen to be created, but you also need it to be calcified so it can be hard and strong, right? And of course, all of this, creates the osteocytes within the lacuna just like we've seen before. So slide 57 shows you a picture of intramembranous ossification, right? And so all of the primary ossification centers grow together, fuse together, and they become very heavily calcified and covered eventually by the periosteum, which holds all of those bones together. 
um, slide 59 shows those ossification centers growing closer and closer together until um, it is complete. Of course, some of the skull bones, for example, don't fuse together completely until after birth, and that's why we say that we have uh, several different skull bones and not just one skull bone. Uh, and that's, of course, to squeeze the birth canal. We'll, we'll have a chance to see a fetal skull in lab, so you can see where those fontanelles are and the suture lines. Don't worry, there's lots of fun things coming for you. So that slide 61 shows you how all of that originates from start to finish, right? You start with a primary ossification center, and you have a couple primary ossification centers, and then eventually they all grow together through the process of ossification and calcification. Here's where I will stop because the lecture picks up here with endochondral ossification. Let me know what questions you have, and have an awesome, awesome day. I hope all of this recorded well for you. <laughs>